thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, this is an um, iteration of a talk. I've done it a couple different um, other formats. And you all have to forgive me because um, I have a bunch of fancy titles and I'm an academician, which means that um, even though Cheryl and I talked and I said, oh, I only have three or four slides, I ended up having like 20 slides. Um, so we're going to try and burn through these slides. But I really want this to be a conversation. And so there's going to be some opportunities for me to actually stop and wait for you all to respond to me. And uh, just so you know, I'm very comfortable with uh, awkward pauses and long silences. And so the longer you guys go, the more it encourages me to keep pausing, pausing <laughs> to keep the quiet, because I want you all to give me some feedback um, and join me in this conversation. Um, so I have no financial disclosures. This is, again, something that uh, is very much in academic talks. Um, there's not a lot of money in talking about diversity and inclusion. Uh, maybe one day uh, there'll be buckets of money just flooding into this. But for now, I do this talk because this is something I'm passionate about and I love. Um, and uh, this is also a joke. My goal is not to make you aware of all of the issues that impact our patients in an hour, but just to get you thinking about what our patients are experiencing when they come into the emergency department. And so we're going to do this in a series of cases and conversations and experiences that I've had as a physician. Um, and then hopefully you all can take that back and see this in some of the experiences that you may have had um, in your various um, iterations, whatever role you hold here in the hospital. Um, so um, please uh, understand that I'm teaching this and I'm presenting this from a uh, physician standpoint, um, but this can be applicable to any position at any point in the hospital because our patients are interfacing with everyone. It's not just the doctors and the nurses, but it's the techs and it's the registration and it's the security and it's the folks in billing and it's the folks that are answering the phone calls. Uh, it's the parking attendants, whoever it may be. All of these people are coming in contact with our patients and they can have a positive or negative impact on their experience with the healthcare system. Um, and they can oftentimes, unfortunately, reinforce negative stigma uh, that they may have already about the healthcare system. Um, so there is an elephant in the room. Not only is this Martin Luther King Day, but I'm a black male talking about healthcare workforce issues. And this is something that I've had to come, become comfortable with. And it's something that I've chosen to do as part of my career because I think it adds um, uh, value to me personally, but I think it also is something that needs to be done. Um, and I've been granted a number of opportunities uh, to give these talks and to be in the positions in, that, I'm, that I am in. Um, and I should use my platform to um, have these conversations. But I would challenge each of you to think about your platform and where you're at. And if this is something that is meaningful to you, how do you have these conversations um, in your arenas? How does this happen in the boardroom? How does this happen in the meeting before you get started talking about quality measures? How does, it get, how does, how does this um, discussion come up um, when you're going through your morning reports and you're talking about that difficult patient who's in, you know, room 250 or in the ICU in bed eight, or how are we going to, you know, address these issues that we're having with uh, certain patient populations and interpreters or, <laughs> or dealing with difficult family members that we may not understand. Um, and if you're thinking about this, not just from a um, dollars and cents perspective, but you're thinking about it from a true quality and patient experience perspective, then you have to talk about diversity and inclusion. You have to talk about health equity. You have to talk about social determinants of health. You have to talk about bias. And these are all some of the things that we're going to try and parse out a little bit in this presentation. And again, I don't expect us to get to every single answer. Um, and I don't expect you all to walk away saying, I know how we're going to fix every problem within our hospital when it comes to these issues. But I do want you all to start thinking, maybe there's an opportunity for us to do better. And whatever role that is, whatever, whatever um, vantage point that you're taking this from, there is an opportunity for all of us to do better. Um, so obligatory MLK quote, uh, since we're doing this on uh, the, the day we celebrate his birth, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice in the healthcare, in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, let's just ponder on that for a little bit. Shocking and inhumane, injustice in healthcare. So I guess my question to you is, what is an injustice in health? So this is going to be one of those first awkward pauses because this is a question. And so I'm posing it to you. What is an injustice in health or health care? Uh, access. What do you mean by that? The ability to know who to go to with your concern or how old it is. And so what often? 
So what often do our patients do when they have concerns about access to health? What do they do? They don't go in. So they don't seek care. Or they seek it at the last moment and they come see me in the emergency department, right? And then I do what I can, understanding there's limitations to what I can do in the emergency department. What else is an injustice in health? Yes, ma'am. I think is that patient going to be treated fairly? Is the person doing the treatment, are they going to treat them as a human being who's not feeling well? You mean? Is that person going to be the person, you know, giving the treatment, are they going to be biased because of the way the person looks or acts or, you know, dress or whatever? So do we give all patients the same care regardless? And do we treat them fairly and humanly? humanely? Okay. Yes, ma'am. The concern of the patient itself that when they come in to the foundation, maybe the healthcare providers, the whole team doesn't really know how I would like to be taken care of. Ah. You mean looking at it from the patient's perspective? Yes. Maybe they don't know me. They don't know what my needs are. What the is. Yeah. Did you look at my slides before? Uh, All right, because we're going to get to that. I think no. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, do we, are we just treating them because this is what we do, or are we treating them because um, this is what the patient wants? Yeah. Interesting. Anybody else? I'll take one more. Yes, ma'am. That healthcare studies haven't really focused on people from certain backgrounds. Ah. You know, it's interesting. So my, my wife is a medical geneticist, uh, and she does precision medicine. And um, all of the studies in precision medicine um, right now, and precision medicine is sort of like looking at your genome, so breaking that down as to um, your, your DNA and looking at how to fight the disease based off of your DNA. But unfortunately, most of the studies are looking at a very narrow subset of our population, which is typically white males, right? And so if you're looking at that and saying, this is the treatment that we're gonna pr um, prescribe for all patients, but you're only looking at it for very one, uh, small subset of patients, um, what is the likelihood of that patient, uh, that treatment actually being um, effective for all? Great, great, great points. All right, so this is a little bit of a trust exercise, okay? Nobody has to move, nobody has to get, to, get up, nobody's gonna touch you, um, but I need you all to trust me, and then I want you to close your eyes, all right? This is gonna be a case, I want you to close your eyes, uh, all right? So I want you to imagine a patient, all right? Now, you can open your eyes because I need to give you a little bit of backdrop just to put a little clarity. So I pick on the emergency department a lot in my talks because I am an emergency medicine physician. Um, all of these cases, all of these conversations that we're having can be applied to any other part of our hospital system. Um, but I pick on the emergency department because it's easier to pick on your own. And if I were to go and pick on internal medicine or neurology or psychiatry, as an emergency medicine doc, it doesn't always jive well. So I pick on emergency medicine because if I could pick on myself, then I could pick on anybody, all right? So now back to the trust exercise. Everybody close your eyes. So I want you to imagine a patient, right? Uh, I want you to imagine a 28-year-old woman who presents to the emergency department at about 10 o'clock at night. She's coming in, she's here in her chief complaint uh, meaning the reason why she came to the emergency department is because uh, she's having vaginal bleeding, heavy vaginal bleeding that's been going on for about four hours. So I want you to think about the patient, think about the experiences that they're gonna have coming to the hospital at that time of day, what may have led them coming to the emergency department then, why they're in the emergency department, All right? You got that picture of the patient in your head and the, sort of the reason why they came to the emergency department you have a picture of that, what that patient looks like? All right, now, keeping your eyes closed, think about that same patient, but let's add a different context. What if that patient came into our emergency department and they were wheelchair bound? Does that change the care that they would receive? Does that impact the way that we treat them in our hospital? Keep your eyes closed. What if the patient only speaks Cantonese? Does that make any difference? What about if not only does that patient only speak Can Cantonese, but her eight-year-old son is with her and he's the only one that's able to translate? 
Does that change things in your mind? Does it make it any different? What if that same patient that came in wasn't Cantonese speaking, wasn't wheelchair bound, but only had an eighth grade education? Does that change the way we treat this patient? Does it change the way you think about this patient? What if that same patient came in, college educated, well appearing, um, she came in with her female partner? Does that change the way you approach the patient? Does that change the way you treat your patient? What if that patient is from a particular faith and they don't want a male provider? They only request a female provider. Does that change the way we treat the patient? Does it change the way you think about that patient? All right, open your eyes. So, anybody want to share with me what their initial thought of what that patient looked like? Anything? I was picturing myself. Okay, that's fair. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see it. I see it. I'm certainly not going to dispute it. Anybody else? Yeah. But then we as we started going through the different scenarios, not a lot changed, right? But a lot changed. Whether it's a patient who's in a wheelchair or non-English speaking, where English is not their first language, or they have a lower education level, or they have a different faith than what we're typically used to, or um, their sexual orientation and gender identity is different than what we would expect. So a lot of those small variables may change the way we treat pa that patient. Yes, ma'am. The only one I had a question with the last thing you did, mm -hmm. the question, she only wants a female. Mm -hmm. What if the ED has no female physician? Yeah, we struggle with this often. We do, we do, because a lot of times there aren't female providers in the emergency department. And so sometimes we have a PA that's available um, and they may be female, but that doesn't always guarantee that we're gonna have that. And so we have to have those negotiations with patients because it's about what you were mentioning earlier is getting to where the patient wants to be. So the reason why I do this is not because I want you all to think that every, and there, there may be a small subset of people in the room who says, we should treat every patient the same regardless when they hit the door. But when you think about these variables, there are different things that we need to do for each of these patients, right? If the patient's in a wheelchair, we need to be more accommodating. We need to think about what we can do to make sure that this patient is comfortable. Because if they're gonna need any sort of procedures and they're in a wheelchair for whatever reason it may be, we need to think about how that patient may feel um, physically and then also emotionally how they may be feeling about this experience. Or if the patient is non-English speaking, and we're using their son to translate, an eight-year-old boy. Can you imagine being an eight-year-old boy having to describe what's happening to your mother in something that's, um, I would argue, relatively private, right? But how often do we take these shortcuts and use the person that's in the room to translate for our patients? Um, we oftentimes use very large words, right? Menorrhagia is the way to describe heavy vaginal bleeding. We don't use common words for our patients. What about making our language that we have available for our patients at a reading level that would be appropriate? Very interesting aside for this. So we did a study a couple years ago at BI where we looked at um, reading levels and understanding comprehension of discharge instructions. And so, um, um, so this is all done in downtown and we gave our patients standard discharge instructions and we looked at their comprehension of their discharge instructions um, and did all kinds of like chi-square analysis and double reviewers and all this other fancy um, um, research jargon. And two things came out. One is that our patient education level averaged out to be about 14 years, which means um, some college education. Um, but the average medical um, um, literacy for our patients was around an eighth grade level. Interestingly enough, women was about ninth, men was about seventh, so you, the women brought up the men in the group. Um, but if you think about health literacy, 
and we're talking about terms that we think are commonplace, and we use all these acronyms and we toss them around like they're nothing, our patients may not understand them. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity. I know we're in Massachusetts, we're in a much more progressive state uh, than other places where I've given this talk, um, but there is still some bias that happens to our patients when they come in um, and they are um, not your typical heterosexual couple. Um, and then lastly, we talked about the faith. That's something we have to consider um, about what to do for these patients, right? So. This is, uh, these next two cases are the two, and this picture's not gonna show up too great, so we'll just skip through this one. This is my typical knowledge, uh, teaching of um, when I was in residency um, training, become an emergency physician, and then also in medical school. These two cases are sort of what we were taught when it comes to health literacy, I'm sorry, um, um, cultural competency about patients. And so quickly, 14-year-old male involved in a car collision, he suffered severe injuries, including a splenic laceration, blood pressure's low, his heart rate's high, he looks like he's gonna die, EMS brings him into the emergency department. Um, you know, we determined that he needed a blood transfusion for resuscitation uh, as part of his care. When you go to consent, his parents who made it to the emergency department saying that this is what we're gonna do, they declined for religious reasons. And the question is, what do you do? Now, this is something that medical students and residents will see on board exams, they're gonna see on licensing exams, um, they're gonna see throughout, um, and it's a very common ethics case. What do you do? Oh, you're such an administrator. <laughs> so, I, the, correct, sure, um, but the answer in the emergency medicine teaching is you transfuse, right? You do, um, because they're 14, they're not, of, they're not able to consent, it's unsafe, uh, they need to be transfused, um, it's an emergency. You as a physician would be protected. However, what we often don't do is think about what happens to these individuals in these hypothetical cases. So let's take this case, right? So we have a 14-year-old male involved in a uh, car collision. We don't know any of the background, but he comes in and he's really sick and he needs blood. And we determine that we're going to give him blood. And we give him blood. But what are the ramifications to him afterwards, assuming that he survives from his traumatic injuries? What happens to this individual? He declined a blood transfusion, or his family declined it, because of religious reasons. Well, in some religions, if you receive a blood transfusion, you are banned from that faith. And so what has happened now is we have taken this child, this 14-year-old, we've done something to him, which we think was medically necessary, and legally it is necessary. But the ramifications for this child is he could now potentially be banned from his, from his religious community because it's a decision that was made for him, not by him. So we don't always think about these next steps. Now, I would still give this blood transfusion and I would tell him, you know, we, you, know you gotta work through all of this with his family and counseling, and yes, you need to get ethics on board and get spiritual leaders involved and do whatever you can to make sure that this child is made whole um, not only from a um, physical sense from the traumatic injuries that he suffered, but also from the spiritual sense and the impact that you're gonna have on him uh, potentially long-term from his community. Um, this picture doesn't show up too well, um, but this is a young boy who presented to the emergency department with these strange markings on his back. And um, the reason why I present this, this is often shown as um, um, a misunderstanding of uh, cultures. This is always assumed, often assumed, often assumed to be child abuse, because you can see there's these markings all over this young child's back. You see going up and down and side to side. Um, but this is actually a practice called coining. And many of you have heard of the terms, most of us have never actually seen it, but it's very common in some Asian cultures um, where you uh, heat up a coin and you use it to rub along um, the uh, uh, certain um, uh, planes of the skin, um, certain directions uh, as a way of healing. It's um, something that's very common in other cultures, not common in ours, but because we don't see this, we assume that it's child abuse, and then we get the AOD involved, and we go on, down these, all these different directions with filing 51As for, on behalf of children um, when there's actually nothing wrong. The other thing that we often confuse this is, is, is this source with some sort of bleeding disorder, and we start uh, torturing the child with lab work, um, when really they came in with a fever, uh, and part of their parents' healing process for this child's fever was this procedure. 
All right, so what is this? It's not our emergency department, it's a hallway bed. So let me tell you why I got all into, into giving these talks. You've seen this before. Yeah, so this is how I got into giving all of these talks, right? Um, this, is, this is how I, not, not necessarily giving these talks, but getting more interested in health equity, uh, cultural competency, and social determinants of health. And so as a third year resident, I was working in the emergency department in um, downtown. It was a fairly busy shift and we were moving around uh, and I was taking care of a lot of patients. And they would put this young gentleman, um, probably 50 or so in the hallway, and he came in with pain on the left side of his abdomen, um, with some nausea and some diarrhea, almost a classic story for diverticulitis, but he had never had the diagnosis. Um, and they put him in uh, the hallway sort of at the beginning of my shift. Um, and I saw him in the hallway, I told him what was going on, um, and I said, hey, we're gonna do some blood work, we'll probably end up doing a CAT scan, and depending on what your, your imaging shows, we may or may not need to admit you to the hospital. And so, started the plan, went about my shift, saw a number of other patients, but this gentleman was always in the hallway. And I kept walking by him. And as um, you know, some of my colleagues from the emergency department may know, um, I talk a lot. And so I would see this gentleman and we would, I was walking by him and I would have a conversation with him, talk about sports, talk about what's going on with his healthcare, talk about whatever, just to keep him comfortable because I knew he was in an awkward position being in the hallway. Um, and uh, you know, towards the end of my shift, um, I walked over to him and I said, hey sir, you know, we're work, uh, finishing up with CAT scan results, came back, you have diverticulitis. Um, you know, based off of what we're seeing, you should probably come into the hospital. Um, your antibiotics are going, we're gonna get you a bed upstairs. And he said, great. So I walked away and I said, you know what, I should probably go back and chat with him um, just to um, make sure he understands, uh, make sure he understands all this. And I went back and I said, hey sir, did you have any questions about what I said? Cause I'm gonna be leaving, my shift is over. And he said, no, I appreciate it. You were really helpful. Thanks for uh, explaining everything to me. And I was about to turn and walk away. And he said, but you know, doc, I do have one question. And I said, well, what's that, sir? And I turned back and I was expecting him to say, can I get a pillow? Can I eat? Can I get another blanket? And he looked at me and he said, why do they always put the black patients in the hallway? And I froze because I didn't know what to say. And I looked around and I looked at him and then I did a quick assessment of our emergency department. Now, downtown, we have a core area in the emergency department that's about 16 beds, and it's a big sort of ring. And then sort of interdispersed in the, around the edges of the ring are hallway beds. And I did a quick view, and I said, damn, he's right. There are probably nine patients in the hallway. Uh, five of them were people of color, maybe six were people of color. Um, and I didn't have an answer for him. And so reflexively, um, I apologized. I tried to make it right, tried to get him a room. Um, but ultimately, he was going to be admitted to the hospital. The emergency department was packed to the hilt. And we couldn't get him a bed um, in, the, in the emergency department. He ended up going to the floor shortly after I left by the end of my shift anyways. Um, and I brought this up to my emergency department leadership. And I said, hey, you know, I had this interesting interaction with the patient. And uh, when I said this to them, you, could, you should have seen the uh, shock and dismay uh, in their faces as well. Um, and so we did an assessment of this. And um, we looked and we said, who gets put in the hallway? And there was some truth to what he said. Um, it wasn't that minority patients alone got put in the hallway more, uh, but we in particular put our homeless patients in the hallway more. Um, and we, for some reason, put our patients with limited English proficiency in the hallway more. Those are the two groups that had the highest uh, sort of odds of being put in the hallway. Um, and I could give you excuses for the homeless population. Usually these individuals are coming in and they're intoxicated and then we need to keep an eye on them and they're gonna be discharged soon and they don't need monitoring, yada, yada, yada. But I can't explain the limited English proficiency patients. More specifically, I can't explain that because oftentimes these are the patients that we're working with interpreters where we need a quieter space because we're using an iPad or a telephone or working with a third party who's in the room to have a conversation with these patients. Um, but we put them in the noisiest places of the hospital. Um, and uh, I still don't have an answer as to why this happens. Um, I know our downtown hospital is not alone because other hospitals have looked at this and other emergency departments have looked at this. Um, but for some reason, we put our, um, a certain population in the hallway more so than others. Um, we're controlling for all kinds of things like severity of their disease and insurance status and chief complaint and all those other things. 
Um, so this ultimately led me down the road of trying to understand more about this concept called health disparities. Anybody want to take a stab at a definition of a health disparity? Don't worry, I have a beautiful graphic that's going to be very helpful, but I'd love to hear what you all think about health disparities. Martin Luther King said injustice is in the healthcare system. I mean, that may be a good place to start, right? Anybody else want to put a little, a little more meat on the bone for that? Well, let's start with disparities. Forget this word. What is disparities? Unequal. Unequal. There's a difference. There's a chasm, right? And health. There should not be chasms in health. There should not be unequal health. There should not be disparities in health. So has anybody ever heard of the Shulman study? It came out in 1999. It was a study that was done, published in New England Journal of Medicine. So for me, this is sort of my entree into the understanding of what health disparities were. Um, this study came out shortly before I started medical school. Uh, and I'll give you the context as to why that's important for me. Um, but the short version of, of this is they took a vignette of a patient who was presenting to a clinic with chest pain. And it was a very classic story of unstable angina, patient had exertional chest pain, some dyspnea, resolved with rest, um, had risk factors including high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, I believe those are the two risk factors, maybe high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Um, but had a classic sort of story, oops, classic story for um, what, um, um, at, at that point in time, a patient should undergo cardiac catheterization uh, would be. And so what they did was they took this vignette and they attached one of these pictures with it. So younger black woman, older black woman, younger black man, older black man, younger white woman, older white woman, younger uh, white man, older white man. Um, and so they put a picture on top of these vignettes and they handed them to physicians. And they asked the physicians to read about this hypothetical patient and then make this, uh, recommendations as far as what type of care the patient should receive. Now, I just explained to you this is a conversation about health disparities. So anybody want to take a wild guess as who got the best care? <clears throat> who got the best care? White the younger white male. So we're saying right here, this guy here. Who got the worst care? Older black woman. I mean, this is like, you know, when you, I, I don't have the, 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 the data um, that to support this. I'm just giving you a synopsis of the study. But this is the study that came out for me in, sorry, in, that came out in 1999. They really shine the light on health disparities. Now, if you go online and you read the um, New England Journal article and then you read the letters to the editor, you should hear the vitriol that comes out of some of my colleagues' mouths when they complain about the quality of, of this study. But the reality is, this study is rooted in science. This study is factual. These women were receiving lower quality of care compared to their white male counterparts. Um, and this was not emergency medicine physicians. This was at a large conference. I believe it was like AMA or um, the AMA conference or some larger conference. Um, so it wasn't specifically focused on emergency medicine. This is all comers of physicians who volunteered to be in the study. I believe they tried to focus in on internal medicine docs and cardiologists um, was their target, target group. Um, but this is the sort of sentinel study that really put health disparities on the map back in 1999. So I started medical school shortly afterwards, and let me tell you, there was three camps that people fell into when this study came out. One was, it happens, but I treat my patients all the same, so this would never happen to me. The other was, I already explained to you, the complete and utter hate that came out about this article um, and the deniers. And then there was a third facet that said, oh, you know what? Black women present differently with chest pain, so they all get cardiac catheterizations. So there were tons of black women who were going into, car going into the cardiac suite uh, to get catheterizations that probably didn't need it, but they were just trying to overcorrect um, to uh, make sure that they didn't miss anybody. Um, but interesting study. Go back and take a look at it. It's a good sort of review, and it helps sort of put an um, understanding around health disparities. So as I mentioned, pretty graph to explain health disparities. So quality of care up here, and then 
the different groups, minority versus non-minority. And then there's a difference in care, right? And so the difference happens when the hospital systems or discrimination, bias, and stereotypings happens, right? This is the disparity. Sometimes there's a difference in care because the patients want it. That doesn't mean it's a disparity. That just means there's a difference. Now, you could put any group in this minority category. You could put LGBT. You could put the disabled. You could put limited English proficiency. You could put blacks, Latinos, Asians. You could put just about any category comparing them to the minority. Uninsured, definitely. They can go into this category. Uh, lower education can go into this category. So you could put just about any category and this definition will still ring true. And as evident, this is um, from this book called Unequal Treatment. Now this came out from the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine. And what they went and did was they compiled every single study they can find. And I believe this came out in 2002 or 2003 um, of um, bias and health disparities in medicine. And no specialty is immune. Um, no parts of the hospital are immune. Um, everything from insurance um, to the policies we make as, an instit as institutions uh, to the care they receive in the emergency department, the psychiatric wards, um, the neurology uh, clinics, um, the pediatric intensive care units. No part of our hospital would go untouched because there are disparities at every single level in every single part of medicine. So how do we address health disparities? Um, I'm not gonna ask you to answer this question because there's no one right answer. Uh, there are different components that are sort of appropriate to address this. Um, so we have to address bias, we have to address cultural competency or cultural fluency or cultural awareness, or whatever the exact buzz term is that we're using for cultural competency these days. We need to address the social determinants of health. We need to make systemic changes within our institutions so that even if a provider may be biased or um, uh, someone they inter a patient may interact with may be biased, uh, the system prevents the patient from falling through the cracks. Um, and there's other things that we need to do, like workforce diversity. Hopefully we'll move along. Um, has anybody ever done the implicit bias testing? Yeah. I won't ask you to share your results, um, but I've done it. And uh, I have bias. I have, um, and it, it, it shocked me when I did it um, because I didn't think that I was gonna be someone who had so many bias, biases, um, but I had them. And I was really disappointed in myself. Um, but it brought something to me uh, to, the f to the forefront, which um, is that I need to be aware of how I look at my patients and how I assess my patients. And so I encourage all of you to go to implicit.harvard.edu. It's a website, you can Google it, and take the implicit bias testing. And you're gonna do it once and you're gonna say it's ridiculous and you're gonna do it a second time and you're gonna say, oh, maybe there's something to this. And by the third time you do it, you're gonna be like, you know what? This is something I need to start thinking about a little bit more. Um, but that's sort of the unconscious bias. There's the overt bias, or racism is the uh, appropriate way to term it, um, you know, that happens. Um, and if that's the case, we need to be calling that out. So if you hear or see one of your colleagues, no matter where you're at, making a comment or saying something that's inappropriate, we need to be calling them out, we need to be reporting this, we need to be running this up the, the chain of command, um, because honestly, these patients shouldn't be um, taking care of patients. There was actually a young lady who was a, um, uh, resident in uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and this story just came out a couple months ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, um, who tweeted that she intentionally gave Jewish patients the wrong medicine. Now this is an intern training to become a um, internist uh, in their primary care track uh, at the Cleveland, Cl Cleveland Clinic, um, and she was espousing these um, sort of beliefs that Jews deserve lower quality of care. She ultimately lost her spot in residency, and she'll probably never be able to work as a physician again. Um, but people who are that willing to express um, racist, uh, bigoted, homophobic, whatever views it may be, um, that openly, honestly, should not be allowed to be in front of patients and taking care of patients. Um, now, that's the extreme case. That's not all cases. Um, and it's not going to be as overt uh, as that. 
Um, but these are things that we need to be calling out and we need to be making sure we address. Um, within medicine, this is how racism plays out. So this is a book, uh, it's a New York Times bestseller, came out sometime in the mid 90s. Um, and it's a, a, a series of stories that talks about how racists lived in America. And the one story I wanna to call to your attention was the story of these two gentlemen. Um, they were best friends, they grew up in Cuba. Um, they defected and moved to the United States um, as teenagers. Um, but best friends all along. They lived with family, lived in the same environment, same neighborhood, same community, uh, went to the same schools um, after coming to the United States. Um, but their story focuses on how they were treated differently within the healthcare system and how the person who uh, was perceived to be white because he had lighter skin um, received better quality of care compared to his friend from childhood who was black or darker skinned. Which is interesting because in Cuba, they don't have those same um, sort of uh, uh, dichotomy of white and black. There are some, some uh, skin color issues in, in the country, but not nearly as severe as what we're dealing with in the United States. But their story highlights how different quality of care they received um, in the healthcare system upon coming to the US compared to what they were receiving in Cuba. So if they ever have time, go back. This is a New York Times bestseller. I'm sure you can find it on your Amazon, Kindle, or um, your Nook, or whatever reading utensil you use. But it's, a, it's an interesting read. And it, like I said, it's a series of stories that talks about race in America. So uh, cultural competency is really about context. And I think it's something that you were bringing to the point earlier. Um, it's that uh, we need to think about how we treat our patients um, in relation to what they're experiencing uh, and what their definition of health is. So cultural competency, these are two definitions. One is more for an individual, um, and one is more for uh, providers and systems. Uh, but it's basically a way for us to be in a position to have an understanding of our patient's background, where they want to go with their health, and how we can aid them in helping them along that way. We are a part of their process of become, making them help, uh, healthy, um, or keeping them healthy. Um, and we need to make sure that we are putting in place the structure in order for us to do the work that our patients are asking us to do. So I ask you to think about who you are right now. Um, again, this is a time where I don't want you to answer, but I'm just going to take a couple minutes to think about you as a person, your religion, your culture, your upbringing, and how you view health. So just think about that. We're going to give you like one or two minutes to just think about this question. What are you or who are you and how that impacts your health and your view of health? You guys got an idea of who you are or what you are and how that impacts what you believe about medicine? Now, my view is that um, as a physician, I am sort of anchored in science um, and I often admittedly overlook um, the impact of spirituality in medicine. Um, specifically in that um, I struggle when my family members um, or patients that I'm caring for want to overemphasize, in my view, um, faith or prayer prior to treatment. Um, and this is, again, a bias that I'm willing to admit. Um, now, I grew up in a house where we went to church twice on Sundays because my mother is Catholic, my father is uh, Protestant, um, and I was doing Easter poem um, uh, uh, prayers on Sunday with my father and then also serving as an altar boy uh, in the Catholic church. Um, I still go to church almost every Sunday, um, pray every night, teach my, ch my children about my faith, um, but I still struggle with this, and I have to admit that this is a bias that I have when it comes to the patient, um, the care that I provide my patients, because sometimes I'm like, all right, I know you want to pray, I know you want to pray, but let's get you down to CAT scan real quick. You know, let's, let's pray on the way to CAT scan. Let's, you know, I'm, I, under, I understand you want to, you know, talk to your, to your pastor about this, but I really think these antibiotics are going to be helpful. So let's, let's do two things at the same time. Um, but that's a bias that I have. And hopefully you all are willing to admit that you have some bias, maybe not as severe as mine, but you may have some. And it may come down to things like, you know, um, prescribing birth control, um, 
which is a, a big topic. Um, or um, when you have a patient uh, who is transgender, or when you have a patient um, who is Muslim. I mean, these are things that we need to be thinking about because it may be impacting how you're interacting with those patients. And now, sometimes our beliefs and the patient's beliefs about healthcare differ. And we need to be cognizant about that. And how do we, how do we rectify in our minds that a patient may want something different than what I want? So when I was a resident, I went and did a rotation um, on the Navajo Reservation um, in Tuba City, Arizona. So about three hours north of Flagstaff, I'm sorry, three hours north of um, Phoenix, an hour or so west of the Grand Canyon. Um, how many of you all have ever been to a Native American reservation? Show of hands. So a few. Um, definition of abject poverty uh, for many of these places. Um, and so I go and I'm taking care of this woman who comes in. She's an elderly woman. She has a urinary tract infection. Um, we prescribe her antibiotics. And the ED doc that I'm working with leans over and says, you know she's not going to go take those medications. And I'm like, why? We told her she had, she had classic symptoms of a urinary tract infection. We did a urinalysis. It was positive um, for a UTI. We gave her the appropriate antibiotics. Why would she not take it? And he said, she's going to go and talk to her um, elders and go talk to the, the faith healer in the community first. And she's probably going to try uh, traditional medicine before taking these antibiotics. And I was like, but we just gave her a treatment. And he said, you gave her your version of a treatment, not what she wanted as a treatment. She wanted the diagnosis. She didn't necessarily want our antibiotics as the treatment. And she preferred to go and get her treatment uh, elsewhere. And I had to come to grips with that. And I had to accept that, not only because um, the patient already left my emergency department and there's nothing I can do about it, but because it was actually the right thing for her to do. And who am I to say that her decision when regards to the type of treatment she wanted was right or wrong? Um, now, there are some conditions where, you know, not getting treated because you want to try other forms of therapy is, uh, you know, not based in science. But what she wanted to do was actually based in something that, although it has not been proven in a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, has been proven throughout the years in her culture. And there's no science to go along to back that up. But they have a tradition uh, and experience within their culture that that was the appropriate uh, direction to go. And I have to trust and accept that with them and patients. And so oftentimes we think about how culture and language have an impact on health, specifically um, how a religion may impact um, someone's willingness to accept treatment, as mentioned earlier with the case uh, about uh, the 14-year-old uh, who needs a blood transfusion. But oftentimes we have a, uh, another population here, um, Christian scientists, uh, who tend to lean more on uh, spirituality and faith and prayer uh, as opposed to seeking traditional um, treatments that we would prescribe in the United States. And I could tell you about cases like that. Or we could talk about what happens to our Muslim patients when they come in with health issues during Ramadan and whether or not they're willing to accept treatment because they should be fasting and some consider getting IV fluids um, breaking their fast for Ramadan. Or we think, need to think about how a disease or an illness is perceived within a community and how many of our patients don't want the diagnosis that go along or the stigmas that go along with the diagnosis, specifically it being HIV and schizophrenia. And there's a large um, sort of um, um, stigma that goes along with this in some communities that patients will refuse treatment because they don't want to have that diagnosis. Or we need to think about the interactions that our patients may have had in the past or the cultural context that go along with uh, what happened uh, in certain communities and how they see health providers and don't necessarily have the same trust uh, in the healthcare system as we would expect or want them to. Now, everybody knows of the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, and just if you haven't seen the movie, Mrs. Evers Boys, it's a great movie. The quick, ver dirty version of the Tuskegee experiment is um, the United States decided it was a great idea to study the natural evolution of syphilis uh, in black males um, in Tuskegee, Alabama. And even after a treatment, uh, penicillin was discovered in the early 70s, um, they continued to watch these men suffer from syphilis and did not prescribe them treatment uh, for the disease that they had. These patients weren't injected with the virus, uh, with the, with the uh, infection. Um, they had it naturally um, through their sexual interactions. 
um, but they did, were, they did not receive treatment because we needed to see what happened in the natural progression of this disease. Anybody heard of the Mississippi appendectomies? This is probably something that should be more shocking uh, that goes under the radar. So what they were doing back in the early 1900s is they were telling uh, young black women that they should go and have these procedures, um, uh, prophylactic uh, appendectomies, uh, so that they uh, wouldn't get the disease later in life and potentially kill them. These are young, healthy women, and they're saying, come get this uh, uh, appendectomy um, so we don't have to worry about you getting it later in life. Well, what they were at in the early 90s, I'm sorry, early 1900s, so like 1910, 1920, what they were actually doing was they were performing hysterectomies on these women. And so these women were now sterile. They could not have children. And it wasn't that they were doing this for any medical reason. They were just trying to prevent these young women from reproducing because they didn't want any more black children being born in Mississippi. So I feel like I'm weighing you down. All right. Um, let's go over one last case, and then we're going to wrap this up, OK? So a case is a 65-year-old male. All right. So we're going to talk about the 65-year-old male, um, two different patients. Right? Uh, one is a dropout of uh, the third grade, worked in a rice field making 25 cents a day, I'm uh, sorry, a week um, in the 1940s. Uh, started smoking at age 12, drinking at 15, lives in a rural community, occasionally unemployed because of his seasonal work. So think about the health of this patient. And I think about this patient here, who's a small business owner, attends church regularly, supportive family member, married to a healthcare worker. He's a homeowner and he's well respected in the community. If I were to ask you which one of these patients is sicker, A or B, who would you say? A, right? A sounds sicker. He sounds, he sounds like he would have somebody who would be more likely to have diabetes, high cholesterol, cirrhosis, mental health issues, you name it, right? Why? Because of all this stuff, right? He dropped out of third grade, so he has lower education. Smoking and drinking, works physical labor, really hard work, lives in a rural community, something we often don't think about. We're uh, fortunate to live so close uh, you know, in the suburbs of Boston. We live in Boston metropolitan area. We have access to so many things. A rural community has experienced um, much different health care uh, than what we've uh, received here um, in the Boston metro area. And occasionally unemployed, so that means um, his insurance status is questionable. So all of these things are potential flags to determine what his health would be, social determinants of health. What if I told you this was the same person and that this is my grandfather, who indeed, indeed dropped out at the third, uh, in the third grade um, because um, he needed to support his family. And with the third grade education, there's not a lot you can do in rural Louisiana. Uh, so he worked in the rice fields. Um, he started smoking and drinking at an early age because that's what you did at that age because manhood was considered much earlier at that time and drinking and smoking in the, as a 15-year-old was commonplace. Um, and for a long time, he, was, um, go with, he would go long gaps without having a job because, again, he had a third-grade education. Uh, but my grandfather went on to be very successful. Uh, he went on to open up a business. He went on to... Uh, become probably what I would say the best barbecuer in East Texas. Uh, and that's no bias on my end. I really enjoyed his barbecue and so did others. Um, he married my grandmother who was a um, nursing assistant. Um, he was well respected in the community. Um, but those things in his early childhood followed him and impacted his health along the way. And I'll save the story that I share oftentimes about my grandfather's interaction with the healthcare system. Um, but I witnessed firsthand the bias that my grandfather experienced um, in seeking health. Um, the short version is uh, I was down visiting him and I went to um, an appointment with him and I was not able to go into the room with him right away, but by the time I got into the room, he and the doctor were going over his MRI results. And the way the doctor was speaking to him, who was much younger than him, um, calling him by his first name, not speaking to him with respect, asking him over and over, did you understand, do you understand, um, uh, in a very derogatory, demeaning tone, 
Um, and I could see my grandfather, A, initially growing angry, then B, um, withdrawing from the interaction. And it wasn't until that I intervened and said, I actually am a doctor. <clears throat> and then the uh, doctor in the room said, or said, doctor? I said, yeah, I'm a doctor and I work at Harvard. He completely changed his demeanor and his approach in the way he interacted with both me and my grandfather. Um, but that completely ruined my grandfather's experience with this doctor that he was um, uh, interfacing with. Um, and ultimately it led to my dad, my grandfather never going back and seeing that doctor and not receiving the care that he probably needed um, uh, because of a negative interaction that he had with that, that provider. So not only did my grandfather have many social determinants of health uh, that would that led to him being unhealthy, um, but then he also had bias and experiences within the healthcare system that made him not seek the care that he ultimately needed. Um, quickly, social determinants of health, something that we often don't think about as we think about us, uh, our roles in the hospital. I know many times uh, my colleagues and I in the emergency department struggle with this because we're taking care of patients and we, do, we treat them and then we send them back out without really thinking about the, all the other things that are happening to our patients. Um, so if you think about my grandfather, you think about his economic stability, you know, making 25 cents a day when he was in, you know, in, in the 40s, uh, 25 cents a week. That's not a lot of money. Uh, and even if you adjusted it, that's below minimum wage for what he would have been you know, making if, in 2019. Um, neighborhood and the built environment. You know, we talk about all the problems that our inner city communities face, but also our rural communities often face um, a number of issues when it comes to uh, the quality of the neighborhoods that you're living in, the access to opportunities and, and healthy lifestyles, whether it's gyms or healthy si or sidewalks or safe places to exercise. Um, health and healthcare, we are a big component of the social determinants of health, probably not as much as we'd like to give ourselves uh, um, credit for, um, but we do play a role in this process. Uh, social and community context, um, that's who you're around, who you're uh, interacting with, um, the people that are um, in your life that are supporting you for health. And then lastly, education. And again, my grandfather having a third grade education really set him behind when it comes to uh, having an opportunity for high quality health. So the take homes for my discussion are, um, you're likely to have different, a different definition of health than your patient, and it's okay. Um, our goal is not to impose our beliefs on our patients, and we must work with our patients to meet where, them where they are at, and we must accept that we have bias, um, but we have to address it. Ultimately, we need to do what's best for our patients.